special commemoration of the centenary of Nelson Mandela, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, humanitarian, and the first democratically elected president of South Africa. Uh, before going any further, though, I would like to lend an appreciation to the singer in hand. Uh, he is Lynn Madden, and he is a drummer. He's gathered us into this space, and uh, so we'd like him to begin, and then Ricky to follow up with a few words about the other song that Madden sang. Thank you, Jerry. <clears throat> the reason we're here it's very special, and as an indigenous man, we, a salient feature of any society is who gets honored. At this moment, we gather to honor and remember, in a good way, Nelson Mandela. Um, as an indigenous South African, we have a worldview that is quite strikingly similar in the way we see uh, the world. We know about oppression, we know about cultural genocide, we know about genocide. Uh, indigenous peoples, we know the war is on indigenous peoples in much of the world. Um, so it is after resources and these things. So we have a man, now I've never met Nelson Mandela, but I know of him. And as much as like the great leaders of the past, we've never met them. But we know of their values, their principles that they live by. And Nelson Mandela lived by indigenous principles of caring for one another in a tribal map. Today, tribalism seems to be a threat to world view mainstream. But we retain those worldviews in indigenous communities. So <clears throat> we think about those things. And um, we have much of those same struggles here in America. So we love those men like Nelson Mandela and the work that he has done for the people. In our way, we say, uh, one has a big heart for a day. We see my stepson here, Landon, Manitowoc, he has the way he goes. The way he goes, it's a sound of the heart, it's, it's hand drum. And she the way he is a bigger drum, it's sounding of the heart. We have a community, O Dana, a gathering of hearts. We have a society, and it's called Anaku, Men of Dana, they can come together, they're linked by a gathering of the heart, a, a good heart. We hear men like of the past, not only Nelson Mandela, but also Martin Luther King speak of a beloved community. So this is what we're talking about when we use indigenous languages. The same struggles that Nelson and the people went through there, from the Thimbu tribe, indigenous, um, Madiba clan, we also have tribe. Here. So we look in a good way to start off in a good way. We honor um, Nelson Mandela and we thank him and um, all of the things that he has done and all the indigenous peoples throughout the world today. And this way we render this opening song, Mandan, uh, render this song in a good way. We have good thoughts and a good opening. Thank you.
for that and for gathering us into this space and setting the tone for this ceremony. Uh, I also want to let you know that you can feel free at any time to go have refreshments and drinks. There's some punch, there's other things to eat because later on we're going to have a toast to Nelson Mandela. So as you're so led, go ahead and, and, and get some refreshments. So with your presence today, you're joining in a worldwide celebration endorsed by the United Nations and with countries around the world carrying out their own observations of Mandela Day. Minnesota is unique in that our state has an honorary council for South Africa resident in Minneapolis. And the Mandela Centenary Committee in the Twin Cities and St. Cloud are carrying out their birthday commemorations as well today. We are all linked by the shared commitment to the values of social justice, equity, and reconciliation embodied in the man whose birthday we celebrate today. Here in Duluth, we are fortunate to have had the support of Mayor Emily Larson in our centenary planning. As far back as March, the mayor enthusiastically supported our request for a proclamation for Nelson Mandela. We would like to thank Mayor Larson and ask her to read the proclamation as well as another special message. That was hard to give up, actually. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Williams. Can I stretch out a little bit? Uh, it is really a pleasure and an honor to have all of you here today. And it is with a humble heart and an open spirit that I welcome all of you to the mayor's reception room, which really is your room and our room and the people's room. So it's really a beautiful, array of spirit and heart in this room. I can feel it. I can hear it. And it's, it feels really nice. I've been looking forward to today for a long time. A lot of times this room is used for really official business and this feels like really official business to be here celebrating. So I've been, you know, contemplating today coming up for quite a while and it was back in March. I think that we did this original proclamation and it seems so fitting that to celebrate Nelson Mandela and his work and his life and his spirit and connection, that it's a celebration that takes a while, that it started in March, that it continues today. And I've been thinking about how great it feels to feel connected around the world today. We have a lot of reasons to feel disconnected and a lot of encouragement to feel disconnected. For me, it's a really um, difficult time to see how we are being viewed around the world and to see how, how we can be generalized into these big buckets of ignorance or maltreatment. But today, I feel really connected around the world and how beautiful it is that Duluth gets to be a part of that connection with so many people. Uh, when I have read Nelson Mandela's writing, what, one of the things that really, for me, distilled to his essence of everything that I've read of his or about him, is he really has talked about what we get to learn. And, and that when we are these beautiful babies, we learn to love. <laughs> um, and that in that process, we are also taught hate. We are born really with either propensity, we are born helpless and in need of care and support. But the ability for us to teach one another to unlearn that hate and to replace it with these hearts filled with love. I have yet to make a decision in my personal life as a family member or in my day life as a mayor. I've yet to make a decision rooted on kindness and love that I have regretted ever. And when it comes down to its purest form, those are never decisions to shy away from. Um, and they almost always open up joy and love in other people, and those are the connections that we need. So it is really with great joy that I get to celebrate with all of you today. And I do have this letter from the South African Embassy I'm going to read, and then I'm going to reread the proclamation that we first shared. I think it was at the Tweed Museum, correct? Um, in March, I believe. So this letter is from M.J. Mahlamu. Really? Okay, awesome. <laughs> Ambassador 
Greetings. As the ambassador of the Republic of South Africa in the United States of America, I am pleased to welcome everyone gathered for the Nelson Mandela Day. This year we are also celebrating the Nelson Mandela Centenary under the theme, Be the Legacy, celebrating Nelson Mandela Centenary. Centenary. Thank you. Centenary. 2018. The theme means that each person should emulate the true values that Madiba upheld. He was a great leader who showed the world what selflessness is. He strived to attain peace, demonstrated forgiveness, ensured justice and equality for all. As the celebrations get underway, I encourage every person to reflect on what they have learned from Mabida and his approach and apply it to everyday life. Not only in his values did he display them, but also in his daily life. And we need to relive his values to keep his dream alive, that of a better South Africa, and to make the world a better place. We therefore encourage all of us to perform acts of selflessness, giving back to those less fortunate and improve the lives of others. Thank you to the mayor and to the people of Duluth for keeping Mandela's legacy alive through the myriad of symbols and tributes. So we are connected here to the South African Embassy in Washington, D.C., which helps connect us around the world. So thank you for bringing that. very long time. I think we started talking about this 18 months ago, even something like that. And last week, um, I walked by to move into my office, and uh, the door was open, and the conference room table was here, and there were these amazing, wonderful, beautiful, powerful women organized around the table, uh, putting the finishing touches on today. And so it's really so wonderful to read even that letter from the embassy, talking about his values, Mandela's values, his love, his tribute, his selflessness, and to know how much that has already been carried out. Even though we're starting today, we've started the celebration in March. We heard beautiful words and singing, and thank you, Ricky. There'll be celebration and drumming, but how much of that was even just visible around that beautiful table here last week. So with that, a proclamation that the organizers helped uh, put together a proclamation from the city of Duluth. Whereas Nelson Mandela was born on July 18, 1918, in South Africa and occupies a unique place in the world. Whereas on February 11, 1990, a dignified elderly man walked hand in hand with his wife, from whom he had been forced to live apart for 27 years, out of prison and into history. Whereas Nelson Mandela's immense courage and personal moral authority moved out of the shadows of his prison cell to stand as a beacon of hope, first to a bitterly divided nation and then to the whole world. Whereas Nelson Mandela visited Minnesota in the year 2000, following his single term of office as president of South Africa. Whereas Nelson Mandela continues to represent the human spirit's triumph in the face of adversity, and it is in this context that we celebrate the life, legacy, and values of Nelson Mandela in the city of Duluth, Minnesota. Whereas the world celebrates the 100th anniversary of his birth in 2018, and we join with cities in Minnesota and around the world to celebrate 2018 as Mandela Centennial Year with a variety of programs, of edification and enlightenment honoring the legacy of Nelson Mandela. Now therefore I, Emily Larson, Mayor of the City of Duluth, do officially proclaim today, July 18th, 2018, as Nelson Mandela Day in the City of Duluth. joyful courage that he brought, that beautiful smile that emanated, and I can't help but just feel hope when I see images of it. So may that be us. Thank you. That was so inspiring. Here we are in Duluth, celebrating the life of this man. And I'm so grateful that you're all here. Nelson 
Roy Kafka Mandela, who was born in Transkei, South Africa, on July 18, 1918, the son of a tribal chief of the Timba Nation. When colonization by the Dutch and other Europeans was established in the country, the rights and nationhood of the indigenous population were dissolved. As in our own country, indigenous people's lands were relentlessly expropriated with fertile and resource-rich areas taken over by the white population. Forced migration, suppression of native languages and customs, and exclusion from all political life marked a rigid system of racial separation and domination that was codified into law, into law in 1948. This is the society that Nelson Mandela was born into. Trained as a lawyer, Nelson got involved in the resistance against apartheid early on. Although he could have chosen to have a safe life as a lawyer, he had this innate sense of justice and had to participate in resistance. For his acts of resistance, he was convicted of treason by the South African government in 1964 and condemned to death. This sentence was commuted to life in prison on Robben Island, a desolate rock on the coast of Cape Town. And there he was initially in solitary confinement. But when Mandela later joined with his fellow political prisoners, they formed study and debate groups. He took correspondence courses, and uh, during the one time per month when he was able to write a letter, he corresponded with world leaders as excuse me, his international opposition to his imprisonment and to apartheid swelled in the 1980s. So you can see just in, in that instance, in that instance of punishment, and solitary confinement, working, uh, breaking rocks on Robin Island, no protection for his eyes, which damaged his eyes for the rest of his life. He didn't uh, dwell on bitterness and resignation, but instead he and his fellow apartheid fighters who were in prison set about making themselves prepared and for the country that they were going to govern and to be able to govern it wisely. So facing all kinds of, as I mentioned, external pressure to apartheid and the liberation fighters within South Africa, the South African government was forced to reverse its bans on all political parties and to announce Mandela's unconditional release. Which they had offered him earlier. They had said, well, if you repudiate your views or if you tell us things about your fellow prisoners, we'll let you go. And he refused to do that. But in this case, with the unconditional release, which happened in February of 1990, Mandela, Mandela walked out of prison after 27 years. So negotiations went on following his release and led to a lasting settlement that ended apartheid. Mandela and the then president, F.W. de Klerk, jointly received the Nobel Peace Prize for this achievement. And in April 1999, South Africa had its first full, fair, and free elections, and Nelson Mandela became the president of the new South Africa. One of the things he did, first of all, was to set about healing the rifts of the past. He oversaw the formation of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in which the former crimes of apartheid were acknowledged and investigated but stressing individual forgiveness and helping the nation move on to unite and move forward. Mandela retired from the presidency in 1999 with ill health curtailing his public life in his later years, but he still remained engaged in many of the important questions of his country and the world. Uh, he had uh, established the Mandela Children's Fund during his presidency, he, he donated a third of his salary to the establishment of that fund, which continues today and has helped hundreds of thousands of indigenous children. He also campaigned to highlight the issue of HIV AIDS treatment uh, at the height of the epidemic in South Africa. And that alone helped to remove some of the stigma and the, uh, the desperation of the people who were suffering at that time. 
Russell Mandela died on December 5th, 2013, after a long illness with his family at his side. The world is going to acknowledge Mandela as one of the great political figures of the 20th and 21st century. But in honoring Mandela today, we also acknowledge the people power that helped lead to his release from prison and then kept up the pressure to end apartheid. For decades, black South Africans as well as white and other, and other ethnic South Africans of goodwill and supporters around the world, including Minnesota, which had a Minnesota Anti-Apartheid Committee, which I was a part of. All these people refused to let his name and mission be forgotten. Mandela himself acknowledges this truth, stating, quote, since my release, I have become more convinced than ever that the real makers of history are the ordinary men and women of our country. Their participation in every decision about the future is the only guarantee of true democracy and freedom. That message resonates with citizens everywhere at all times and in all countries, including our own, that the struggle to gain and retain freedom is ongoing, and that resistance to oppression is the responsibility of all of us. And now I'd like to bring to the podium Janet Kennedy, who is the Vice President of League of Women Voters in Duluth and a community activist. She's a founding member of the Cross-Cultural Alliance of Duluth and business owner of Healthy Alliances Matters and has initiated the anti Woman campaign. Janet. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I feel honored, and I feel like this is a place where there's some healing. Um, many of you know I've gone through a few things this last few weeks, and even earlier this week. And at first, I didn't know if I could be here, um, but I'm proud and glad to be here. And I'm proud that my mom supports me and shows me that I can be resilient. So thank you for being here. So my name is Janet Kennedy and I'm a League of Women Voters, Duluth, a Vice President, and I will be President-elect for 2019. Our current President, Christina Woods, is not here with us today, but I want to make sure I give her honor. It's a very important time, and I believe this is the first time for the League of Women Voters that I have an Indigenous person and an African Heritage person leading the organization. So I want to give it up for all the women who were there before me and who have stepped forward to mentor myself and Christina and taking that bold step for justice. So please clap for the League of Women Voters. So I'll start with a little history, you know, um, and I remember my history comes from my mom and my father coming here. She married a soldier and we came to Duluth because of the air base, and so we're still here. But even farther back, we had a history that I don't even know about and never learned about. And so I'll just start with the things that I've learned. South Africans struggled for generations before achieving the right to vote. They lined up in the millions to vote in their first democratic election. The black majority and righteous South Africans of other ethnic backgrounds struggled for generations for all to exercise this expression of citizenship in their own homeland. That is a right that sometimes in the United States we take for granted at our own peril. Nelson Mandela, Nobel Prize laureate and first democratically elected president of South Africa went on to say, I waited for 70 years to cast my first vote. As the world held its breath, South Africans together made their mark to bring into being one of the truly remarkable events of this turbulent century. Once more, we affirmed a truism of human history that the people are their own liberators. I voted not only for myself alone, but for many other took part in our struggle. I felt that each one of them held my hand that made the cross, held me to fold, helped me to fold the ballot paper, and push it into the ballot box. Here at Lee Women Voters, we support that struggle and want everyone to understand that we are all equal at the ballot box, but only if we vote. 
First, LWB is the nation's largest and longest standing grassroots voter registration organization. We work year round to make sure all eligible Americans, especially first time voters, non college youth, new citizens, communities of color, indigenous people, and low income Americans have the opportunity to register and vote. Elections impact every aspect of our lives, and we all need to weigh in. Through our award-winning voter education programs, our volunteers equip millions of voters with essential information about the election process, provide trusted and sought-after information about candidates and issues on federal, state, and local ballots. Every year, we host thousands of community events to mobilize and help voters participate as well as hundreds of debates and forums nationwide for voters to hear directly from candidates. Second, leagues across the country, including our own local league in Duluth, the largest in the state, know that there's much to be done to make sure that equity and inclusion are built into all our policies and that our elected leaders reflect the diversity of our citizens. Nationally and statewide, there's a move by LWB US to become more inclusive in our practices by instituting a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens to social impact work and to build leadership across all cultures. Locally, we have formed a cross-cultural committee dedicated to including all voices. We have been leading people where they are at, registering and educating voters across our city from Western Duluth to Eastern Duluth. This year, we will be adding another voter registration opportunity in Proctor, and we'll be hosting in collaboration with the NAACP and other community partners a Get Out the Vote Festival. It's called Souls to the Poles, and that's spelled S-O-L-E-S. This will be on October 13th at Denfeld High School. In conclusion, as we continue to work moving forward with everyone, our efforts in the days ahead are in memory of Nelson Mandela, who showed us by example how to bring people together. Before ending, I would like to share a quote from Nelson Mandela that has impacted me greatly in the last past couple days. And he stated that, when the water starts boiling, it is foolish to turn off the heat. So I want to give honor to Nelson Mandela, who left a legacy of how civic engagement can make a difference, and that to remind you that voting matters. Thank you. And now I'm going to bring to the podium Dr. Helen Morgan Morales. She's an associate professor of education at the University of Minnesota, Duluth, and a distinguished teaching professor. And she's going to share her reflections of someone who grew up in South Africa in the times that we've been discussing and now is here in Duluth. So please join us in welcoming Dr. Morgan Morales. my remarks with one of those warnings that you sometimes hear on the radio or the movies, um, that what you're about to hear um, might um, make you want to flee the scene, because it may be disturbing for you. Um, my warning to you is that although I will try not to, I doubt if I will be able to make it through my remarks today without crying. I don't know that I've ever been able to talk about South Africa and the horrors of the apartheid regime that were inflicted upon my country people without deep grief overwhelming me. Since I came to live in the United States in 1984, people here have often asked me why it was that I was able to speak out about apartheid, both as a child and as a young white person growing up in South Africa, and why it was that many South African whites did not. First, I need to say that my efforts were not always consistent and pale to virtual insignificance compared to many, but still a minority of the white South African population who did speak out and who devoted and in some cases gave their lives to the anti-apartheid movement. And those efforts in turn didn't begin to touch the incredible work, dedication and profound sacrifices of tens of millions 
Sie erklären nur, ich habe es dann einfach gesagt, keine, es ist etwas leer zu werden in dem Projekt. Und wir sagen profound, every single day, as a result of the project. To honor the gate, today we honor the greatest of these people, Nelson Kholikaha Mandela of Tarno, and, and celebrate his 100th birthday. As part of this, I was invited to share my story. And I do this in hope that what I say might help others, and in particular, people here in the United States, and give them something to think about as we witness what has happened here in this country and in Duluth right now. I was born in Johannesburg, South Africa on March 20th, 1960. That is significant because it was the day before the Sharpeville massacre when the apartheid government escalated its brutality against black South Africans. On that day, the police killed 69 unarmed black protesters and injured more than 180 others. As a result of the ensuing black rioting across the country, the government banned the African National Congress. As a co-founder of the ANC Youth League in 1944, Nelson Mandela was already a key leader in the anti-apartheid movement. He and other key ANC leaders were driven underground when the ANC was banned. And that's, that's also important in my, in my story. In 1962, when I was only two years old, Mandela was arrested and in 1964, as Jerry explained to us, sent it to life in prison on Robben Island. From that time until 1990, it was illegal for any news or images of him and the ASC to be released within South Africa. Because of the banning of Mandela and the ANC, which prohibited us learning anything at all, or even talking about their work. As a child, but especially as a white child, I was at first oblivious to who Mandela was, and I was unaware of all those banned or imprisoned and persecuted by the apartheid regime. While Mandela was enduring unimaginable and censored horrors on Robben Island, and my country, people of color, 86% of the population suffered daily persecution and indignities as a result of the apartheid regime and police state. Um, as, um, <clears throat> and uh, while I, as a white child, lived in a segregated bubble, my ignorance was not only directly as a result of the apartheid regime and its policies, but as I increasingly came to realize as I grew older, also by the collusion most white people, the 14% who were able to vote and to keep the all-white government in power. But this collusion went so much deeper than whites voting and acting directly to uphold apartheid through power that at every level of society. It was also, and very importantly, white inaction, apathy, and complacency. It reminds me of the words from Ellen Maxwell's song, By My Silence, based on Pastor Martin Niemann's letter during World War II about his opposition to the Nazi and the silent consent of the German people. When people ask me what it was like growing up in South Africa under apartheid, as a white person, I think about Maxwell's and Niemann's words, and they shake me to my core because with hindsight, I realized how true this was for myself and for most white people in South Africa. I quote here some lines from Buxtel's song. I'm not a communist, so when they came for the communists, I held my tongue, minded my own business like a good neighbor. I trusted that justice be done. I didn't ask what was their crime. It was their sadness, wasn't mine. I didn't care where they were sent, by my silence, I gave my consent. In South Africa, government censorship, control of the media, propaganda not only in the media, but also through the tightly controlled public school curricula and segregation of people by race in where they lived and where they went to school, meant that it was all too easy for white people to live our lives not knowing the truth of what was happening in our country to people of color. Note that I say all too easy, not impossible. 
This point is very important, especially when we look not only what happened in South Africa and apartheid, but what has happened in other countries around the world, like Germany and Hitler, and what happens in, to this very day. When I first thought about why I feel so deeply passionate about the evils of apartheid, discrimination and injustice, I intellectualized my response by attributing my beliefs and actions to how I was raised by my parents to respect all people. But I came to realize that although that certainly contributed to it, the reason was much simpler. It was because of my deep and profound love for a little woman, Maria Kumar, who was my nanny and who was an integral member of our family. I was raised not only by my birth parents, but also by Maria. I grew up spending many hours every day with Maria and with her friends, other black South Africans, getting to know them as people. Because of the laws of the apartheid system, people of different races in South Africa usually did not mix. They were not allowed to live, to play together, to go to school together, and to get to know each other as human beings. I still cringe with deep shame and horror when I recall how all too often when white people did interact with people of color, and I use the terms used in South Africa in a master-servant way, even when very young children spoke to adults of color. White children grew up seeing black people, not seeing black people as people, as human beings who had their own lives, families, feelings, and aspirations. For me, because I loved and respected Maria deeply, and because I came to know her and her friends as people in their full humanity, from an early age, I felt profoundly torn by the dissonance between what I knew about them and what I witnessed all around me in the news, out in public, in school, and even, perhaps especially, in my interactions with dear friends and family. Even as a young child, I could not understand how white people could say and do such hurtful things towards people who were just like someone I loved. It was that simple. It was about love. It was about seeing people's humanity, and then about speaking out, even just at the level of interrupting prejudice when I saw it happen, not remaining silent, not giving my consent. It also led to my becoming increasingly politically active, working in my first general election for the opposition party when I was in third grade. Oh. Fast forward to age 24 when I was a teacher, by law, teaching in an all-white school. Um, I was required by law to join the South African Teachers Council for Whites and as a member was expected to perpetuate the South African government propaganda by teaching a skewed version of history in South African life as laid out by the government prescribed curriculum. But I refused to do this, to join the council or to remain silent. I kept returning the membership papers to the South African Teachers Council, noting that I would not join the racist organization. Eventually, I had to make a choice, give up teaching, join the council, or leave the country. Because I could, and most could not, I made the heart and soul-wrenching choice to leave spurred by the voices of South African people of color who encouraged me to go to the United States and to speak out there. As I reflect back to growing up in South Africa and how we as white people went about our lives, blaming it on the multiple systems of oppression that were the foundation of the apartheid, the apartheid regime, I realized that it was so much more than that. By being raised in a system that dehumanized people of color, it was all too easy to allow ourselves to be unaware of what was going on. But it really was by allowing ourselves. Censorship, segregation, propaganda are very powerful tools, but they do not stop us seeing, speaking out, and acting. Today, in the United States of America, we cannot blame our ignorance and apathy on legal, enforced segregation, or on imposed censorship of the press, at least not yet, or by dispelling what Al Gore called inconvenient truths as fake news. I believe that what Mandela taught us 
is that if we open our eyes and our hearts and pay attention, if we get to know others not like us, if we seek to find out, to listen, to learn, to risk discomfort considering multiple perspectives, and then to act, we can make a difference. This is something every single one of us can and must do. Some people who are called to leadership have the skills to be organizers and activists on a large scale. This can be intimidating to those who do not. We may feel helpless, helpless, and think, what difference can I make? And go about our daily lives safe within our bubble of ignorance and for many, our privilege. What I have learned first from Maria and then later in life from Nelson Mandela is that every single one of us can make a difference at the very basic level of humanity. Getting to know and understand each other without condemnation and with compassion. Reaching out across what divides us. Today as we celebrate the 100th birthday of South Africa's much-loved Madiba, we have the opportunity to revisit the lessons he taught us. Here in the United States of America, or perhaps sadly I could say the disunited States of America, our country has been torn apart and polarized as we spiral down in a vicious cycle of othering. We also see this happening in many other parts of the world. History is repeating itself. We must stop pretending that we don't know what this is about and that it is happening. We must stop. And it is all too easy to demonize and dehumanize others who do not think like us, do not hold the same political views as us, who do not look like us, who do not pray like us, who do not live their lives like us. We may do this by overt, overt intentional actions and words, or by our silence, giving our consent. This is not what Madiba taught us, or Gandhi, or Martin Luther King, or Mother Teresa, or Malala, or the water protectors of the Standing Rock Sioux, or our own local Elishanadi leaders. Thank you.